But we're going to talk about, this morning, we're actually going to talk about that word believe. So it says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we're going to talk about believing this morning. Belief has a lot to do with how we act. Belief has a lot to do with how we act. If I were to say, Let's, who wants to come with me? We're going to line up on the roof, and we're going to all jump off the steep end over there just for fun. Not many of us are going to want to do that because we believe in gravity. I mean, I still come down. Every time I jump, I come down. And I come down really hard, a lot harder than I used to. And but we believe that. You're all sitting in pews right now. You believe that those pews are going to hold you up, that you're not going to fall through. They're very sturdy in construction. We believe these things, and it affects the way we act. It affects the way we think and operate. And so this morning, as we, as we continue through Acts 19, we are going to talk about what to do when the world falls apart. When the world falls apart. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles... To Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Or if you have one of these Bibles that's in the pew in front of you, you're welcome to open up to page 1103. I highly encourage you to bring your own Bible, but I love having these Bibles in the pew. So if, if you're confused when reading through with your version, you can pick one of these up. Or if you are absent minded like I am and you leave your Bible at home, I, I, have, I have come to really enjoy, as someone who loves technology, I really enjoy to read the scripture off the paper. But we'll be in, in verse 21 of chapter 19, page 1103. Starting in verse 21. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together, with the workmen in several trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging them not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, You ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. 
But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are really, we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he set, had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Let's pray together this morning. Father God Almighty, we just love you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you've redeemed us. We thank you that you have brought us up from our sin, that you lift us up every day. Your mercies renew every morning. The, the grace you give overflows from us to others. We thank you so much. We thank you that we have the Holy Spirit who gives us wisdom, who convicts us of our sin, and leads us to grace in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would use the scripture this morning to continually point our hearts to you. That our eyes, our, our minds, our hearts, our soul, our strength, everything would be focused for you. That we would love you with everything we have. That you may be glorified in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So after the events that we went through last week, we find Paul still in Ephesus. And he's still preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus. We're going to start back in verse 21. And he says he's making travel plans. And it says, about this time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. I'll be honest with you, I'm getting kind of sick of hearing Luke write in here, no little when he means very much. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. When he says no little, he really means to say it's very much. So there rose a great disturbance. And in there it says, concerning the way, that was the, the first title of the, the early church. They called them the way because they were for following the way of Jesus Christ. Who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it says Demetrius, a silversmith who was making shrines. They made these um these things for the, this goddess, and they would craft them. And that was their business. They were, and he's coming towards the, um, with all the craftsmen, all the tradesmen, they're, they're in this guild. And guilds were really big then, where they were grouped together by trade. And so Paul, as, being a, as we've read prior, doing tent making, he would have been part of a leather working guild because that was how you kept up with the trade. That's how you kept up on things and, and learned how the market was doing and things like that. And so he's gathering all of these workmen together and he makes this case to them we're losing we're losing our business we're seeing a huge effect because people are turning away from the goddess Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that gods made with hands are not gods amen gods made with hands are not gods and there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the great temple of our goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. And so he says they're preaching the gospel, and it's having this effect on, on not only the, the goddess we worship, but our trade as well. It's hurting our lives. It's affecting the economy. And it says they were enraged this group of people in the city. And they ran out among the city, screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion. And they rushed into the theater. Now this theater is, we still see the ruins of it today. It's still there. And it seats twenty six to 28,000 people. And so all these people rushed into the theater and they drag, they drag some of Paul's friends with him, with them, and they're taking them before the theater, which would have been used for awful things in the Roman times. And they're, they're screaming, there's a lot of confusion. And it says Paul really wants to, wanted to go in. He wanted to take care of this. He was a great speaker already. He makes great cases for, for Christ, and 
He, he sees his friends be taken in and the other disciples are holding him back saying, no, no, don't go in. But he really wanted to be there. And he's upset. And then Alexander wanted to try to say something to the crowd to make a defense for what the silversmith was saying. And they recognized that he was a Jew. And it says, for about two hours, they cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I don't know about you, but I've never heard a chant go on for two hours. Now, I know, if we, I, coming from Alabama, football is really big in the South. College football is humongous. It's crazy. It's a, the schools make millions and millions of dollars every year in ticket sales alone, not counting on concessions. And so it's a, it's a huge thing, and people gather, and, and in, in Alabama, there's uh, two, two large stadiums that we, that we talk about, one for one team and one for another, and every Saturday they're, that they have a home game, they're absolutely packed out, and people get in there, and they scream these chants, and it's very, very loud, but they're not doing the same chant for two hours straight. And so you have to understand with this confusion, they're, they're saying this about this God that, God that they serve, this goddess. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians because they did not want him to speak. Overpowering him with their voices. And the town clerk finally got them quieted. This 20, 25,000 people. And he says all of this. Who does not know of our great city? Who does not know that we are the temple keeper? He says, you guys, if you have an issue, you can settle this in the courts. And without Paul having to do anything here in this scripture and letting the government handle it, we saw that the assembly was quieted. And at the end of, at the, end of the town clerk's speech in verse 41, he says, and when he had said these, it says, and when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So he says these things before 25,000 people, and he says, all right, go about your day. And that's, that's the end. We will, we'll, in, in chapter 20, we'll look through what happened after the uproar ceased. But after that, it ended. So what we're going to talk about today regarding the scriptures, what to do when the world falls apart. These people, the, the people that were making this uproar, they were worried about the economy. They were worried about losing their jobs, and they wanted to make a big deal out of it. Similar to the riots that we have today, that's what we're seeing here. People get up, they, they, it starts out with, with trying to protest something, and then there's more confusion, and then things start happening, and it's and it's interesting to, to read what psychologists say about riots and how it can turn normal people, normal people, crazy because of what's going on around them. So they started stirring up the people with confusion because they were upset, and the city turned into an uproar. When something happens, there's one thing that we must always do first. When something happens where it starts to feel like the world is falling apart, and it may actually be that, like just with the pandemic, when the rest of the world is falling apart around us and everybody's going crazy, everybody's worried, there's fear, there's all of this, the first thing that we need to do is we need to remember who God is. Remember, we, I said we were going to talk about the word believe. We're not going to go jump off the roof because we believe in gravity. When we believe in something, it affects how we operate so if we believe that God is who he says he is and that he does, he can do what he says he can do, we need to first be still and know that he is God, that he's sovereign, he's almighty, he's still on his throne. We have to remember, we have to believe it and let it affect our thoughts and our actions. We're going to, I'm going to let you guys learn some psychology today. I learned some basic psychology when I had depression. I was in college. I lost some dear friends to, friends to me, and it really hurt, and I didn't know what I was going to do after I graduated. And I was just in this 
It was a dark time in my life, and I remember breaking down one day. And I'm crying in my dorm room, and I call my mom, and I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I am just, I'm just in the pits. I don't know what to do about it. And she said, uh, I think you might be depressed. And so she called and found this Christian psychologist. And this wasn't just a, a, science, a science guy who was a believer. This was a guy who believed in God and used psychology to disciple others. And so he started sharing with me that I had, I had circumstances where I'd lost friends. I had circumstances where I didn't know what was going to happen. He said, your circumstances can be affected by your perspective. He said, you can't always change your circumstances, but you can change your perspective. And that will affect your emotions and your behavior. Your perspective changes your emotions and your behavior. He started leading me through scripture. He started asking me about my faith. And he said, I want you to explain your faith to me. And he started asking me, do you really believe it? Because if you believe it, then logical thought follows through on how you should out have an outlook on the rest of your life. I'm still using that to this day. It says in the Bible to take every, we take every thought captive for the pursuit of Christ. And so that means I have to continually adjust my perspective to align it with God's word. I have to continually remind myself to remember who God is. Now this is contrary to how the world operates today. We do not celebrate thinking as much as we used to. We are very considerate of feelings, and we let our emotions rule our behavior and change our perspective. Our emotions change our perspective instead of letting our perspective change how we feel. Now, we have to remember that Paul in this scenario is worried. He's anxious. I would be too. My friends just got taken away in a giant crowd, in a riot, into a theater where they execute people. into this giant arena. He wanted to do something. A lot of, many, many people today are dealing with anxiety on a regular basis. I find myself struggling with anxiety too because we have this fear of what might happen. Many young people, there's been surveys and they, the statistics are that most young people are afraid that after the pandemic, things will never be like they were before and that it's only going to get worse. There's that anxiety. There's a fear of what might happen, and it runs rampant in our hearts today. Seeing these things, like, big things like this happen, just like the, the windstorm, the, the fires in Australia, the many things, the, the hurricanes, all of these natural disasters, the things with the government, the things with the, what's happening on the world stage, it rules our rules our hearts, it takes over our minds, and that fear just overcomes us. But it's important to remember that our perspective and what we believe in Jesus Christ changes how we think and how we view everything else in our world. It's got to be the center of our faith. It's got to be the center. He is the, he is the solid rock, just as we sang, the cornerstone We have to learn to think differently. It says in Romans 12, 1, you will be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We have to learn to think differently. We have to put to the test what we say we believe. So when you find yourself dealing with anxiety, when you find yourself worried about what is happening around you, you need to remember who God is. And there's Five steps that you can follow. Five steps that you can follow to do that. You need to remember these things. Now, this word remember is active. It doesn't mean a passive remember. It doesn't mean I know that. It's in the back of my mind, but I know that. But this means dwelling on it, thinking about it, and understanding it. Remember these things. Number one, you got to remember who God is. That's the characters. That's the attributes of God. Remember who he is. Almighty, sovereign, loving, just, good, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent. He's everywhere. Omniscient. 
You gotta remember who God is. That's number one. Number two is you need to remember what he has done. Remember that he laid the foundations of the earth. He set the universe into motion. He had a plan for our salvation before the world existed. And he followed through on it. He's kept every single one of his promises and he has promises for you that he wants to keep. Second one is remember what he has done. The third one is remember what he promises. Remember what he promises you. He said, I am with you always. Jesus said, I am with you always to the end of the age. In Matthew 28. He has many promises for us. Number four, remember your identity in Christ. Your identity in Christ. I have friends today who are Christians who still beat themselves up over their sin and it tears them apart because we're all still in a fallen world. We still deal with these things and they beat themselves up over it, but we have to continually remember who we are in Christ because Christ has saved us. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy for every day. That means when I failed yesterday, I can get up this morning and live a new day for the glory of of God because of what Christ has done for me. Just like the verse in John 1, 12. For those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. There's identity in Christ. To be a child of God, we must remember that. And then number five is simply believe it. Belief is an action. To believe is an action verb. It's not, a, it's not just a passive. It's a, it means I have to follow through with what I say I know. That means, that means because I believe that driving outside of the, the painted lines on the pavement will get me seriously injured, I don't do it. I have to follow through with that belief. We don't always see the black ice on the roads, but we believe it's there. And if you don't, bad things typically follow. So remember who God is, what he has done, what he promises, your identity in Christ, and believe it. Number two, this is a big point number two. First was remember who God is. The second is the battle is not yours. When the world falls apart, Paul wanted to get in there. He wanted to get in there and make a difference. He wanted to jump right into it because it was tearing his heart apart that his friends were taken in. And they were saying all these things about the church, that they were tearing apart the city. The battle is not yours. And that's why his friends are holding him back. The disciples are holding him back and saying, do not go in. Do not go in. The battle is not yours. My dad used to tell me over and over again, choose what hill you die on. You can't die on every single one. He used to tell me, choose what hill you die on. But if we've sang the song, the battle belongs, oh God, the battle belongs to you. But we have to... Remember that. We have to obey the commander. What he tells us to do, we must do. And so while Paul wanted to do something about it, they requested that he didn't. So it's one thing for us to remember that the battle belongs to God. But our our third big point today is to let God take care of it. Have you ever seen with somebody when they, they hand something over to you, and they're going to let you take care of it to do this, do this task, do whatever. You know, if you're married, you know, it might be cleaning. And your spouse is a lot better at cleaning than you are. And they say, okay, I'm going to let you do the cleaning here. And then while you're trying to do the task that they've given you, they keep meddling. <laughs> oh, no, no, you know, you're not doing that right. Maybe you're trying to cook and they don't like how you're doing it. We need to quit doing that to God. We say that we believe it belongs to him. We say that the the world, that he's sovereign. We say we believe that he can take care of it. But then at the same time, we're at home, we're sitting on our couches or we're looking through our Facebook feed and we're seeing all these things and we start worrying 
And we start getting frustrated when we see the news and we start going, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about this? The world is falling apart. We say we believe that God has it. We say that the battle belongs to him, that he's in control of all the riots, that he's in control of everything that's going on. But we need to let him take care of it. It's one thing to remember. It's another to step aside and to let him take control. If Paul had rushed in, he would have angered the rest of the crowd. They didn't want to see him. They didn't want to hear from him. They wanted to condemn him. But instead, God used the town clerk, who was not a believer, who was not a believer, to quiet the crowd and send them on their way. There are things outside of our control that we cannot change. Those are our circumstances. But if we have a God who's greater than everything, if we have been saved by Jesus Christ, then why should we be anxious? The Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing. Submit all your requests to God with thanksgiving, through prayer. And it says that he will give us his peace. When the world falls apart, remember who God is. The battle's not yours, and let God take care of it. I have to remind myself that all the time. All the time. There's a lot of things outside my control, but I want to be a control freak. You know, I want to hold on to that. And I'll say, I know it's not mine. I know it's his. I know I can't control it. But then I still worry about it, you know? We have to remind each other about this. We have to continue to remind each other. That's why we come together as a church, is to help each other remember the gospel, to remind each other what Jesus has done for us. If you struggle with anxiety today or depression, I, I understand. It's really hard. But there is hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. And if you think it's somewhere else, I'm sorry, that's going to hurt. It's going to be a long road. But when you understand the belief in Jesus Christ and you let Christ transform your mind, it changes everything. I can testify to it. I'd love to tell you about it. I'd love to talk to you about it. And I'd love to pray for you in your hurt because I know it hurts. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I I just praise you and thank you that you are who you are. When we use our best telescopes and we look out into the universe, we see things millions and millions and millions of miles away from us. And we can see how small our little planet is. And when we look at our planet and how small it is and we we zoom in a little closer, we see just how small our country is, just how small our state is, just how small our, our city is. And it's hard to fathom just how small we are. But Father, we thank you that you are a God who created it all. You are the one true God who set all of that, all of these planets, all of these stars, all of these millions of things that we still haven't discovered. You set all of it into motion. And it all spins according to what you said. Father, we pray that we would rest in who you are. I don't have to fear because I know who my father is. I know who my heavenly father is, my heavenly dad. I know that he will keep me safe. 
I know that he will provide for me. I know that he only wants my good and that the hard things around me are just to grow me. Father, we pray that we would trust you in that. That we would trust you in the things that we can't control when the world falls apart. Turn our eyes to Jesus. That we would set our faith in him, our living hope. Hope that is not dead. Hope that is not weak. But that is strong. It is a firm foundation. We pray that you would build our faith on it. We pray that we would structure our thinking around it. We pray that our actions would grow from it. We pray that we would abide in Christ, that we may grow and bear fruit. Because we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. Father, sometimes the things of this world can cloud our thoughts and we can become fearful. And sometimes we even struggle in our belief. And Father, I know that there are some in here who are hurting in that. And Father, I pray that you would comfort them in your Holy Spirit. I pray that, that they would feel comfortable to talk with their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ because in reality, we all struggle. And some, Lord, may have never actually fully believed in Jesus and they haven't seen his transforming power in their thoughts in their hearts. And they need that. And Father, I I pray that you would grant them in your Holy Spirit faith to believe and call on his name, Jesus Christ. And Father, there may be some skeptics who only believe that Jesus saves for the afterlife. But Father, we we do know that he saves today, that everlasting life starts today, that he came to give us life more abundantly. So Father, I pray that you would work in the hearts of those who do not believe, that they may understand. Father, we pray that you would Give us faith that transforms, that you would give us grace that changes our hearts, that changes our minds, that your Holy Spirit would work in us in a mighty way. We pray that our faith would grow so much greater than a a mustard seed and that we can watch you move mountains for your kingdom, for your glory, that your name would be made known and be praised in this dark Matsu Valley. Father, we love you. You are so, so good to us. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. It's in his name we pray. Amen.